So in this video, we're going to perform the last step in our analysis of device-independent quantum key distribution, which is generalizing from security against collective attacks that are restricted to attacking each round in the same independent way to the most general so-called coherent type of attacks. Unfortunately, this step is a step that's quite technical. It's actually very difficult to move from independent attacks to general attacks. So we're not going to be able to do all the details, but nevertheless, I want to give you the main ideas that let us achieve this step. There's two different tools that we're going to survey uh, in this video. First, let's recall the protocol. And by now, you really know this protocol by heart, so I'm not going to go over all the steps once more. What's important, as usual, is that uh, Eve gets to prepare arbitrary tripartite device, A, B, E, she keeps E, gives A and B to Alice and Bob, who use it sequentially, providing their basis choices, collecting outputs, and then they perform certain tests on these outputs that they've obtained for a subset of the rounds. The remainder rounds they use as a basis for their Rocky, on which they perform information reconciliation and privacy amplification. And in this video, we're not assuming that the be devices behave independently at each round. It's just an arbitrary tripartite device that you use sequentially. So let's remember our analysis for the case of uh, collective attacks. So there were two steps. In the first step, we used the CHSH-based guessing game to conclude a bound on the conditional min entropy of Alice's outputs in any one given round. So we managed to obtain a condition of this form that the min entropy of the ith bit that is obtained by Alice conditioned on the corresponding basis being an x and the eavesdropper side information, this was at least a certain quantity which depended on the deviation from the optimum success probability that was observed for the devices in the CHSH game. So this is the condition that we obtained, and we obtained this for rounds that are in the testing rounds, and we were able to conclude that the same condition up to a small loss held for these rounds which are used for the raw key, and this was using a concentration bound and independence. But I also told you that you could get a very similar bound using this concentration bound that we saw a couple of weeks ago that simply uses the fact that the test rounds are chosen uniformly at random. So this is okay. This step is not really much harder in the case of coherent attacks than in the case of collective attacks, so that's okay. The second step is the harder one. The second step used additivity of the min entropy on tensor product states. And so now what we need is that from this uh, single round condition, we'd like to be able to conclude that we can put all the rounds together. So restricted to those rounds for which the basis uh, that Alice uses is a X and also the basis that uh, Bob uses is X. These are the rounds that are used for the Rocky. So we'd like to conclude that this, you know, depending on how many rounds we're considering, some bond like this. And the problem is that this is not true in general. So there's no additivity of the min entropy in case the underlying state is not a tensor product state. There's not even a kind of chain rule that we could use here. Uh, there's nothing that's strong enough that would be fully general. So there's two ways to still uh, complete the proof that I'm going to tell you about that use a little bit more structure of our protocol in order to obtain the desired conclusion. So we are going to be able to show this, but it's not going to be based on a general additivity or chain rule property. It's going to use specifics of the protocol. So let me tell you about these two tools. The first tool is a very important uh, general tool that's useful across quantum information theory that's called the quantum definity theorem. And this theorem will not let us conclude a proof of security in the fully device independent setting because it requires assuming that the quantum states that are within Alice and Bob's device have a limited dimension. And in general, I don't know anything on the dimension of these states, so I can't apply this definity theorem. But still, just because it's a general powerful tool, I want to tell you a little bit about it and I'll show you how it would be used if we knew a bound on the dimension of the systems. So the main observation that's needed in order to apply this theorem is that the protocol has a very strong symmetry. So you can think of the whole protocol 
as a quantum channel, simply a completely positive trace preserving map that takes as input an arbitrary state that was prepared by the eavesdropper, a n b n e, and then it performs a lot of operations on this state, right? There's measurements, there's some tests, there's a lot of things that are performed, right? So you, measurements that are performed by the Alice and Bob devices, we don't know what these measurements are, there's some tests, such as the CHSH test, that are being performed. By the end of the day, what the protocol outputs is a pair of keys, K for Alice and KB for Bob. And so now, the important property that this channel has for us is that it treats each of the subsystems, AN and BN, in a permutation invariant manner. So the protocol is completely permutation invariant. Each of the rounds is treated in the same way. I could randomly permute the way the rounds are numbered at the start of the protocol and randomly unpermute them at the end of the protocol, I would get exactly the same protocol. And now the quantum definitely theorem is a theorem that applies to these kinds of channels that have this permutation symmetry. And the theorem is going to say that informally, if the channel that's implemented by the protocol, so by a certain set of devices, call it phi AB, if I can establish that this channel is secure with some security parameter epsilon when the input state is restricted to having a tensor product form, so basically a state that corresponds to collective attacks, then I can conclude that the exact same channel, so the same devices, same measurements, is going to be epsilon prime, secure for some epsilon prime, on now arbitrary states, states that are made of arbitrary systems, but that have this permutation invariance. Now, what's epsilon prime? Epsilon prime is going to be at most epsilon times some factor, which depends on the dimension. So here's where we need to control the dimension. It's going to be roughly some polynomial in n raised to some exponent, which depends on d. d is the local dimension of any one of the a or b systems. So if these are, for instance, uh, Honor strategies, these would just be qubits. So d would be equal to 2, this would be n to some power, 16, but the epsilon, the kind of security that we get, is exponentially small in n. So epsilon would be exponentially small times a polynomial, we'd get an epsilon prime, which is exponentially small. And in this way, we'd have been able to reduce security against collective attacks, tensor product states, to security against general attacks, arbitrary states. Unfortunately, this requires many more assumptions that we're willing to make in device independence because we don't know that this input state is made of n systems that we can randomly permute because our protocol is permutation invariant. We only have access to one device that we can measure sequentially. So setup is not the same. Also, we don't have a bound on the local dimension. So this could be very large, in which case there's a blow up there that we can't tolerate. So we cannot apply definitely in the device independent setting. It's only useful for the non-device independent setting. Device independent setting is a bit more challenging. And let me tell you about a tool that we can apply in the device independent case. So as we already discussed, what we really want is a chain rule, some kind of a chain rule, something that would replace additivity. Our ideal scenario would be if we can say that the min entropy of xA restricted to those, those key rounds conditioned on the correct basis choices being made by Alice and Bob. And the side information, we'd like to say that this is approximately the number of rounds that are used for the Rocky times the min entropy for just one of these rounds, right? xAi for any one i, or equivalently that it would be equal to the sum over i in r Maybe this is a better way to say it. So the summation over i and r in these entropies. That would be additivity. This, I told you, doesn't hold. Now there's a theorem which tells you that almost as good holds. The problem is that, or it's not a problem, the difficulty is that this theorem is going to require a bunch of assumptions. So what does the theorem say? It tells us what we want. It tells us that the total of n copies of this uh, output of Alice's. So imagine that these are the n rounds that are used for the Rocky. This is going to be n times how much you get in one round. Again, I could rewrite this in the same way as I did here. I could just say this is the sum over all i. There's one small difference here, which is that I didn't put a min. This is just the standard conditional von Neumann entropy, which is actually better um, because this quantity is going to be bigger 
than the min entropy. So in that respect, that's the one respect in which the theorem is stronger than what we want. It's weaker in other respects that uh, we need structure in order for this inequality to hold. There's a bunch of conditions and they're a little bit technical, so I can't explain them all uh, in the video just to give you an idea. One of the most important conditions is that the outputs xa are produced using a certain sequential process. And this needs to be modeled explicitly in order to be able to apply uh, this theorem. So you need to model each step in the protocol as a channel. It's a little channel, phi ab, that takes as input the current state of the devices, ho ab, and there's also the eavesdropper here, e, and what the channel outputs is it outputs a post-measurement state, ho prime abe, and it also outputs outputs um, that have been produced at this stage, and you could also say that it records the basis choices. So you can write, these are classical, there's going to be a theta for Alice, also a theta for Bob, there's going to be in outputs for Alice and for Bob. And there's also other information that we collect at each of those rounds. For instance, we could designate the round as a test round and then we could record the information, was the CHSH condition satisfied or not, right? So there might be some more information that we want. Let's call it TA. This would be a bit that just indicates, it depends on A and B, a bit that indicates whether the CHSH condition was satisfied or not. So this is rather informal, but each of the rounds in the protocol you can uh, model as such a channel. So that's one of the preconditions for applying this theorem. Now, another uh, thing that needs to be verified is that this quantity h here that appears on the right-hand side is not quite the conditional entropy evaluated on the actual input that's given in the protocol to the channel, but it's evaluated on some kind of worst-case input for that channel where I'm not defining worst case, but it's a broader class of states. And so you have to optimize the entropy on this broader class of states. In general, this will give you a weaker bound because you have a broader class of states than the ones that are actually used uh, in the protocol. And then there's a bunch of other uh, technical conditions. There's some regularity properties on how this entropy here behaves in some additional conditions. Okay, so there's a lot of conditions to verify, but the upshot is that these conditions can be ver verified, I promise, in the case of the device-independent protocol that you've seen so far. And once you verify these conditions, you get a very good key rate. And so what ultimately we're able to prove is that this protocol, the device-independent one, is secure and produces an amount of key that scales almost as well as the purified BB84 protocol that we saw before, and we showed secure under much stronger assumptions, under the assumption that you know what measurements are performed, you know that the states that are measured are qubits, etc. So that's the end result. That's as much detail as I can give you in a video on the analysis of device-independent QKD. But you've really seen all the most important ingredients, and I hope that you have a good sense of the proof of security. And there'll be many more resources for you to read about this in more detail available uh, on edX in the lecture notes 